the little things that help me feel proud of myself. So the chat is open if anyone would like to put names in for um, Amisha Berach. And um, I will share my screen so that you can see the... Um, hmm. There we go. So we'll take a moment to um, just bring to mind people that we are holding in our hearts and sending healing prayers, mind, body, and spirit. So I invite everyone to um, really settle in their seats. I am going to stop the screen share. There we go. So really settling. Coming to stillness, physical stillness for a moment. And we'll breathe together. And our breathing together really helps us um, kind of sink in with one another. So inhaling and exhaling. And hopefully feeling really well supported wherever it is that you're sitting today. And today we're going to be talking a little bit about Passover. The holiday starts tomorrow evening. So I'm very impressed that we have such a minion this morning. And people aren't scurrying around with their feather dusters and silver polish. <laughs> So as I was thinking about um, what I wanted to talk about today, I just naturally several things came to mind. But one of the things I just want to very briefly mention is that Passover has four names. I don't know the names in Hebrew, but it's Pesach, which is um, brings to mind the Paschal lamb, the offering, the sacrifice. So it's it's a holiday where we focus on sacrifice, maybe, or offering. What are we going to offer into the world? So it's also the holiday that celebrates spring. And to me, that brings to mind renewal, rebirth, regeneration. So what's new for me this spring? It's the holiday of matzah which brings to mind getting rid of the chametz. I'm going to spend some time talking about that. And it's also the holiday of our freedom, where we celebrate what it is to be free. And then we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So I just wanted to mention these four ways of naming the holiday. And um, for those of you who are going to be attending a Seder, just notice all the fours that come up at the Seder. So we have the four names of the holiday. We have the four questions. We have the four children or the four attitudes, however you want to look at that. Um, we have the four glasses of wine, you know, lots of fours. Um, 
But we're going to start today really talking about matzah and chametz. So anyone who has made sourdough bread, and some of us got very involved in this over the course of the last three years, knows that bread and matzah are almost identical. It's water and flour, and that's it. They're combined and they're baked. One we are obligated to eat during this holiday and one we're forbidden to eat. So the difference is that um, with bread, this mixture of water and flour has been allowed to sit and it ferments and so it rises. So the difference is the air pockets that develop in the bread. Matzah is water and flour, but it's baked quickly, so it can't rise. That's why it stays flat. So bread puffs up. So it's not a big leap to think about the puffing up as a metaphor for the puffing up of one's ego. Not a huge leap. So chametz can represent that puffed up ego. Um, but it also can represent other things that maybe we would like to get rid of maybe a habitual way of behaving or thinking, um, or maybe physical clutter in our homes, or literal, um, literal clutter in our homes or figurative clutter in our minds. Chametz can represent the cleaning out process, which can be a self-assessment. Another way to look at this difference between matzah and bread is that when the flour and the water are left unattended, it grows sort of magically rising and creating these air pockets. And this can be a, 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 a coming to fruition of hidden potential. and expressing that hidden potential. So the nature of chametz isn't that it's bad. It's simply different from not chametz. And as with most things, there's a real need for careful discernment. So I want to suggest that matzah can represent egolessness and the potential for growth and creativity. And chametz can represent an ego run amok. And it can represent personal growth and creativity. So it's both and. And for me, this notion that matzah could represent the potential for growth is directly related to Passover as the holiday of freedom. So with freedom, there are no laws, there are no rules, there are no restrictions. You know, no one can tell me what to do, right? I am totally free. Well, that kind of fully free freedom leads to absolute chaos. Freedom simply doesn't work without some guidelines or guardrails. And this is why some people have tried to grant freedom only to those who have the, quote, proper perspective, who've been educated to do um, the right things with their freedom. So it's really interesting to me that Passover celebrates freedom itself. And in seven weeks, we celebrate receiving the Torah with its laws and its guidance as to how to manage this freedom. 
some would say that freedom is a necessary prerequisite for developing responsibility and obligation. As a slave, there is no responsibility or obligation. There are no choices. So you need to be free in order to be able to make some choices. So the usual understanding is that Passover, the holiday of freedom, is directed toward the goal of Shavuot, the day that celebrates receiving the Torah. So these seven weeks between Pesach and Shavuot is the time when we focus on our spiritual growth so that we're really ready to receive the Torah. So um, just as a spoiler alert for those of you who are not yet aware, the next seven weeks, we will be counting the Omer together on Tuesday mornings and um, preparing ourselves for the holiday of Shavuot. So I think that Passover with its restrictions is a reminder that in order to exercise freedom, we need wisdom and we need discipline. And we certainly need to discern um, where we need to and what we need to clean out. So with that, I invite you to rearrange your seat. Do a little moving around to make sure that you're really well balanced on your sit bones. So you might want to move from right to left and forward and back so that you're really well grounded where you're sitting. And I'm going to invite you to just stretch your arms out to the sides if that's available to you. So you're really broad across the chest. And at the same time, you're lifting up to the ceiling. Being as big as you can be, kind of like a cat puffing up when it sees a dog. And now let your arms drop to your side or your lap, wherever your hands will be comfortable. And as your arms are dropping, drop those shoulders. And feel the freedom in your body, an expanded rib cage. And if you'd like, I encourage you to take a few very nice deep breaths, filling your lungs and exhaling fully with a sigh, making some sound. You might want to do that a few times so that you can feel the fullness. And as you settle, just allow yourself to focus on either your breath, or physical sensation in your body, or maybe a sounds, sounds that are coming to you, not sounds that you're reaching for.
And I invite you to begin to deepen your breath very slowly. You might want to start bringing your attention outward or not. If you want to continue in your meditative state, please do so. And if you're ready to start moving around a little bit, wiggling the fingers and toes, opening your eyes, then do that. Whatever works for you. I have a poem called Passover Love Song that I am going to read. The Seder is a love song written in the language of silver polish and dishpan hands, freshly grated lemon zest, blanched almonds, ground pecans, shelled pistachios, pitted olives, sliced meat, matzo meal, white tablecloths, to-do lists, trips to Borough Park and Shadi's. This is how it's done. Ashkenazi Hiroset, vegetarian chopped liver, my mother's real chopped liver, Bonnie's matzo ball soup, Israeli salad, gefilte fish tarine, chestnut farfel stuffing, tzimis, leek and shallot kugel, salmon and grape leaves with pine nuts, turkey and brisket, coconut macaroons, Sephardic lemon pistachio cookies pecan meringues, chocolate-dipped apricots. Remember, tables stretch the length of the house, tulips on the mantel, my grandmother's blue glass plates, Aunt Hannah and Uncle Joe's silver, Nana's candlesticks, the silver salt bowls from my mother, Freda and Sally's cut glass horseradish pot, the wedding present Seder plate, grape juice stains on the tablecloth, thin paperback Haggadot, our mismatched family of friends, silly half versions of songs, and don't lick the wine from your finger after the plagues. Don't be fooled by the easy domesticity of these words. This is more than a recipe for nostalgia. This is an urgent coded message of survival, adaptation, love. Read between the words. So, happy Pesach to everybody and happy preparation.